Thanks, Narayan. Um, and I double down on the thanks uh, to everybody who has made today uh, possible. Uh, I'm really excited to see what the results uh, will bring. So, so um, the Department of Energy's land use strategy, this uh, clean up to clean energy, is really the next big thing for us in the in this. Um, logical phase in our mission, mission to deploy, deploy, deploy clean energy. It's part of our long uh, legacy of confronting really crisis after crisis that earns the Department of Energy the moniker that I'm very proud of, which is the America's Solutions Department. But to really get that point across so that you can understand the context today, I want to tell you a little bit about the trajectory of the department on our and the way that our missions have evolved over time and how that road has led to this day, this new plan to make the very most of DOE's two million acres of land. So first mission was atomic energy. And so we rewind. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, Oppenheimer yet. Have you? Yes, so great, right? But 1946 uh, was the year that Oppenheimer won uh, or was awarded his Medal for Merit, which w and that was the point at which the Manhattan Project wrapped up it, its mission. And the newly formed Atomic Energy Commission took over America's nuclear program. And then as the Cold War hardened, this precursor, the Atomic Energy Commission, precursor to the Department of Energy, we stepped up to the plate from Washington to Tennessee, to New Mexico, to Ohio, uh, Idaho, South Carolina, all the way across the country, our brilliant scientists used the land that was granted to them to produce plutonium and tritium, to test out new technologies, and to maintain America's nuclear arsenal, uh, making it ready for, for anything. So then came the second mission of our department, which was in the 1970s, the energy crisis. Um, and that, at that point, worldwide gas and oil prices, you may remember if you were around at that point, I certainly remember prices shot up across America, drivers waited in long lines at gas stations wrapped around the blocks to fill up their tanks. So President Carter then established from the Atomic Energy Commission, the Department of Energy. That was our birth uh, moment as, a, as an entity. So we rose to the moment to keep America's power on. So not only did we take over the um, nuclear stewardship mission, but we also began using the Department of Energy laboratories. We now have 17 of them, 17 laboratories across the country to uh, harness the power of the atom for um, civilian nuclear purposes and to develop other sources of energy free of, of carbon, clean energy like the technologies that so many of you now specialize in deploying. So President Carter at that point likened the department's mission to the moral equivalent of war. It would require that level of mobilization, of commitment, of community to um, it, it, you know, make sure that the country's clean energy supply was at hand and the stakes, as he said, could not be higher. Third mission is cleaning up. So that you fast forward over a decade, on the very same day that the Berlin Wall falls, the Department of Energy then takes on this other campaign, which is to address the legacy of our nuclear weapons enterprise. So we created the Office then of Environmental Restoration and Waste Management. Um, you'll hear from Ike White, uh, newly, uh, it, the office was renamed, but at over 100 sites from isolated deserts to downtown labs, we went forward with remediation, cleaning up the lands uh, that we manage in partnership with those communities that gave so much to this country and in partnership with tribal nations that are impacted as well. And so after the remediation phase, um, we now approach mission number four, which is the climate crisis. So this cri crisis is here. 
It's been steadily building through every chapter in our story and for more than a century prior, but we're seeing its effects, as you know, like never before, even here today in this building, uh, as we've had to, Ingrid's had to bring in extra chilling, even though it's hot. Um, but this is, of course, just the tip of the iceberg as we're seeing across the world. Biblical droughts, biblical storms, wildfires, and of course, heat that is killing uh, millions of people across the, the world. So we have reached code red and the clock is ticking. At the Department of Energy, our mission now is to save the planet. Challenge accepted. Since President Biden took office, we've marshaled tens of billions of dollars toward investing in America through his Invest in America agenda to launch this clean energy revolution, advancing cutting edge decarbonization technologies, for example, or reimagining the nation's electric grid, or shoring up supply chains for electric vehicles, or solar, or offshore wind, or wind uh, turbines uh, in general. And this strategy, this policy uh, intervention, if you will, is working, as many of you know. In the, just in the first two years of this administration, we've seen more clean energy deployed in the United States than during any two-year period in the nation's history. And we're just getting started. Thanks to this game-changing suite of tax credits, the private sector has already announced, for example, over a billion dollars in solar and offshore wind projects, over $30 billion for electric vehicles, over $100 billion for expanded and new battery plants, all so that we can build our clean energy future right here on American soil with American workers. And so, we have a new weapon in our arsenal, and that's what brings us here today. This, this strategy that we've been working on for months and building on really for 80 years. And that is that we're gonna take these lands that we've used for decades for nuclear development, for energy research, for environmental remediation, and for the first time ever, we're gonna begin leasing them out so that deploy, it's developers can build some of the largest clean energy projects in the world. And that's why we call it from clean up to clean energy. Thousands and thousands of acres that are ripe for solar, nuclear, geothermal, clean hydrogen, net zero microgrids, battery storage, bioenergy, wind. Projects large enough to power entire cities. So to begin with, over the coming months, we will be soliciting proposals at five sites. One, Hanford, Washington, as was mentioned. It's our first, uh, at the time, uh, full-scale plutonium production reactor in the world. Second, our Nevada National Security Site, the primary place for testing our nation's nuclear weapons in the 1950s. Third is Idaho Falls, we, we, where we produced the first usable electricity generated by nuclear power. The fourth is Carlsbad, New Mexico, where our department honed its ability to safely dispose of radioactive waste. And the fifth is our Savannah River site in South Carolina, which embodies our ongoing, environmental, uh, ongoing mission of environmental remediation. Just to be very clear to everyone, these sites are all safe now. They are completely clean and ready for redevelopment. Um, the Department of Energy, of course, is not the first to lease government land to private industry. We're taking cues from our friends at the Department of Interior and the Department of Defense, but leasing land from the Department of Energy is gonna have some unique opportunities. For one, the tracks that we're talking about are massive and they are contiguous. Our Hanford site, for example, it has the potential to house the largest solar project in the United States of America. Second, environmental reviews and permitting are just plain easier at these sites because our offices have performed decades of site analysis and remediation. Um, so therefore, it'll take less time to get shovels uh, in dirt. 
And third, our broad leasing authority under the Atomic Energy Act allows us to work collaboratively with you, the developers, to figure out creative financing models for projects at each of these sites. So it's a good deal. It's a huge opportunity. And at its core, this project is a marriage of our major missions at DOE throughout our history. It relies on land that we've used to strengthen our national security, our energy security, land that we've dedicated ourselves to cleaning up and revitalizing for future generations, and land that can create good paying jobs and brighter futures for local communities, especially for folks who have too often been left on the sidelines of economic growth. We are all about deploy, deploy, deploy clean energy, and these lands will enable us to do that. So to the industry folks who are here or who are listening today and interested in developing projects at our selected sites, uh, here's my charge to you. Bring us your best proposals for energy projects. Tell us what you would do with this land, how many homes and businesses you could power, how much carbon you could offset, how much closer you can get us to our goal of 100% clean electricity as a nation by 2035. We are hungry, we are ravenous to partner with you. It is um, a game-changing moment. It is a moral equivalent of war, a war on climate change, an enemy that grows larger by the day. I am uh, proud and I will be proud to be a warrior with you in the trenches to combat that enemy and pass to our children and our grandchildren and generations to come a world that we know they deserve. I, for one, am reporting for duty. I hope you are too. Please join me now in welcoming Andrew Mayock, who joins us from the White House as the Federal Chief Sustainability Officer at the Council for Environmental Quality. Thank you, Secretary Granholm. And uh, thank you to industry for this incredible turnout uh, in person and I'm sure online. Um, it's fitting for the announcement that the Secretary just shared with us um, that, that, we, uh, that it garners this kind of enthusiasm, this kind of um, attention. Um, in providing the White House perspective, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to do so. And um, I want to focus briefly on three main points. One, leadership two partnership and three stewardship. I think for, you know, first on leadership, I think it's safe to say uh, as, as we moved into the beginning of the Biden administration, there was questions about whether America could still do big things. And when President Biden took office, um, he made sure that we were gonna do a number of big things and one of those big things was gonna be in this area of clean energy. And he laid out a vision that Secretary Granholm just shared of a clean grid by 2035. And he laid out a whole of government plan to each of us in the federal government to play our role. And he made it very clear when it comes to the US government footprint, and the power of procurement, and the power of the real estate that we hold, and the power, of the, uh, the power of the market signal that we send as the largest buyer of electricity in America, that we utilize that power to lean in and to accelerate and deliver on that broader vision of a clean grid by 2035. And within that plan, he said to the United States government, I want to make sure that we electrify our, our fleet of 640,000 vehicles, our buildings portfolio of over 300,000 buildings. We electrify those and we power those with clean energy. And so what we're seeing today is the clear manifestation of that charge and that mandate from the president. And what we're seeing today, as the secretary said, is you know, not only is DOE executing on a number of big things already that's manifest to us through the clean energy transformation here and the transformation of this department, a once in a generation, if not once in many generation transformation of this department, but, but they're adding yet another big thing to deliver on that mandate today. So I want to thank, uh, when it comes to leadership and leadership in the federal government, I want to thank Secretary Granholm, Deputy Secretary Turk, Under Secretary Crane, my fellow Chief Sustainability Officer Ingrid Kolb, uh, our partner at, at DOE FEMP, Mary Sotos, um, Senior Advisors Kate Gordon, 
and Narayan, who joined us earlier today, and today's panelists who we'll hear from. And we know it's not only about DOE leadership and federal government leadership. I, there's others that have gone before us that have delivered in very manifest ways that show that this is real. And this can be uh, the big thing the Secretary Granholm just mentioned. And so I would like to thank the, the leadership, the Department of Defense, the Department of, of, of Interior, who, who really show us the promise that we're about to see from the Department of Energy as well. And it takes leadership from so many others, leadership from the workers that produce that clean energy, unions like the iron workers and IBEW, from our partners and tribal nations and communities and state and local government, and our, our fellow clean energy buyers. So that, that leadership, is as we know, is not just from the federal government, but from so many others. And yes, one of the most important pillars of that is leadership from industry. So I want to go to the second point of the power of, of public-private partnership and what we're about to talk about today and the opportunity that can be. Because um, we know, and by design in the U.S. government, that, that it, is, it is not government-led, it is government and private sector and communities that deliver on, on, on the Biden agenda and that deliver on the clean energy economy. And we've seen that, as I mentioned, in manifest ways. I had the opportunity to join Kate Gordon at Edwards Air Force Base in California to commission, along with DOD leadership, 1,300 megawatts of solar battery project. Um, just a profound example of the magnitude of what we can do when we utilize the power of the federal footprint and the kind of opportunity that we're going to talk about here today. And the, the work that they did from the uh, leadership of the project developer to the leadership of the construction company to the crews to the community to go do that project and provide that kind of uh, addition to the California grid, uh, as we all know here, as Secretary Granholm just mentioned, is so essential during these times, these urgent times, is a, 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 an extraordinary contribution to the, to the grid, an extraordinary contribution to that clean energy grid by 2035 goal. Um, so we know that it only happens through those of you who have joined us today, and we look forward to sharing more details about that opportunity and sharing more details about the partnership that we can have together and the leadership that you can provide as, as, as industry uh, partners. And the last piece I wanted to note was stewardship. So clean up to clean energy is such a great title and such an important part of this initiative and the, and the president's overall uh, message and overall approach to the clean energy economy because it is critical that we work with uh, speed, action, innovation, and care. And I think all of those are captured in that title and we're gonna spend more time on it today. So it is about not only the stewardship of and, and, the, and maximizing, maximizing the utilization of this vast set of properties and the opportunity that provides, but also doing it as Secretary Granholm laid out, and we'll talk about further here, um, to doing it with the appropriate uh, care and, um, and action um, in, in moving this project forward um, as federal government stewards. So I look forward to the conversation. Without further ado, I welcome the panelists that are gonna dive into this opportunity, share uh, the, 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 the uh, action that we're gonna talk about today and the days ahead. Um, so I welcome Ike White, Senior Advisor of the Office of Environmental Management, Frank Rose, Deputy Administrator of the National Nuclear Security Administration, and Katie Huff, Assistant Secretary of Nuclear Energy. Please welcome them. <laughs> 